so hello everyone, it's really a nice atmosphere here. Um, and uh, today I would like to talk about blockchain, but not just about blockchain, but specifically about Python. What a Python developer can do with blockchain technologies. Uh, how many of you are actually tried to do anything, at least something technically with blockchain, not just sending transactions? One. Who tried at least sending transactions, any cryptocurrency? Like, maybe half. Okay, so um, I think that our format will be good enough because I will do a little bit introduction about blockchain itself, about myself. So, uh, let's start. So, uh, who I am? Uh, actually, uh, I am in Python development for many years, like back in 2005, I think, uh, I, I used to own a Python consulting company, News. Uh, we used to be like up to 10 uh, Python developers in Vilnius and we were working with Python technologies for like maybe 5 years or so uh, and then we started to create our own startups also using Python uh, language uh, and then I failed my startup, had to uh, work for a big corporation uh, and this one particular was really fun because this corporation was 200 years old uh, so it was really interesting to see uh, how, how it's different to startup world when you're living uh, almost in the same place where, where you're working and how it's different with a corporation which is established for 200 years. Uh, after that I moved to another uh, big corporation but this time a little bit more interesting and I used to work at, uh, as a software uh, SRE. Actually we were uh, administrating Linux suite in Uber. Uh, and uh, then uh, last year with my friends we established Blockvis, which is a blockchain consulting company and uh, the, uh, for, for, for a year or maybe a little bit more all of my uh, focus is in blockchain development uh, especially in technical aspects because there are a lot of blockchain experts which are advisors of any kind of how to raise money uh, how to invest in coins and uh, everything else, uh, but we decided to speci specialize especially in engineering of blockchain because that, that, that part was interesting for me. Uh, Bitcoin itself, I was introduced to it in 2003 or 2013 uh, when it was in price of $20, so it's before last peak peak, uh, and it was really nice to see how this time everything repeats how everything grows like in 2-3 months uh, and then just disappears in the next 2-3 months all the price but, but stays higher than it was before so we have the same situation so if somebody is interested in trading so my uh, feeling is that we are in bear market for yet another year so if you wanna sell or buy maybe it's you, you can be take it easy and wait for half a year because price will be somewhere in this range, a little bit up or a little bit down. Because I don't, I don't feel that there is any technological or uh, market changes uh, uh, which would change anything. Yeah? So, so, so we are now in stage of development. And what was really interesting of uh, uh, last time when it was down that. Uh, during that time, a lot of new technology in blockchain was created exactly when everything was done. So that's the best time when to start to look at technology, to learn, because when it will be up, everyone will, will be in rush, they will have no time to learn, and they will hire you guys who will be able to code for any money. And also, I, am, I have my own money, so if somebody tries to hire me, I am accepting only Yara coins. Um, okay, uh, so what we will talk today about. I will explain what is blockchain, a little bit uh, uh, deeper how Bitcoin and Ethereum works. We will go through some simple, simple code of uh, how to create a trans transaction or some smart contract. Uh, uh, for Bitcoin and Ethereum uh, and uh, I will share some ideas where Python developer can make his uh, work like, most efficient if, if they still want to use Python. 
I, I didn't knew uh, that there will be people who are just interested in blockchain because that was initially Python meetup. So all the presentation is targeted to those people who knows Python. Actually, who of you code in Python? Oh, almost everyone, so it's okay. Um, uh, who of you don't code at all? One person, two. Uh, so, 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 but you're still somehow in technology. No, not investors, not uh, also. <laughs> like, but that's not your main activity. Yeah? Hold on. Okay, so that's there. Because if you're just about investing, maybe it will be a little bit boring this time for you. Uh, so what is blockchain? And there are many, many people are talking that this blockchain technology, uh, yet another blockchain technology, let's use it everywhere for everything. Uh, and for me, like actually, uh, the main aspect, uh, what, what I would call blockchain, like where I would say that this is blockchain and this is not, it's when I'm looking uh, on consensus algorithm. Because just to put some, informa uh, some information, some data structure as a blocks or uh, putting uh, each transaction hash after hash, it's not blockchain uh, yet. We, 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 have, we, we can do that on MySQL database. But the question is how, who, who is permitted to write those, that information to that database? And what the rules, yeah? So for me, what Satoshi Nakamoto put uh, it really, really uh, brilliantly, it's the right incentive, why, to run your full node, the, the proof of work, which was not invented, invented by him, himself, but he, he put it in the right, right place, how to solve this uh, uh, right to write into blockchain dilemma, yeah? how to avoid double spending, how to have really de de decentralized money. And uh, so, so this database aspect is not that important as this uh, consensus and decentralization aspect, because that's why blockchain was invented. It was invented for creating better money. So actually for me, also blockchain, it's about programmable money. Because that's what we really have in Bitcoin. And most of things where people are interested in blockchain, still they are investing in coins. And when I'm talking to startups these days, ICOs, which raise 20 million or more, I'm asking, okay guys, so you're creating this super decentralized network. How many blockchain developers do you have? Mm, we don't. We don't. The answer is. Because we just use token as a uh, way to pay for our service in one or another way, even if they are doing decentralized VPN or something like that, it's still just for payments. Because it's, it's not good for uh, any other applications. It's too expensive. And if somebody says that they are using it for that, they just don't try to make it real yet. Uh, I, I, I work with many clients and it's usually like that. Uh, so it's a pro programmable money, and I would say that okay, we have a lot of a lot of cryptocurrencies in the, in the market right now, and you would say that oh, a lot of different blockchain technology, yeah, like more than one thousand. Uh, which of them is actually working? And if you would like to start to, to touch it as a developer, on which uh, you should start to look for? Yeah. So my my suggestion would be start with Bitcoin. Because actually if you will learn Bitcoin, you will learn all the forks and even some like uh, more or less interesting cryptocurrencies like Zcash, which added privacy, uh, uh, really interesting cryptographical things, but still it's on top of Bitcoin blockchain. And when you know Bitcoin, you know the cores and even Ethereum, another blockchain which I would suggest you, if, if you don't like Bitcoin or you were hired to, uh, to code something for Ethereum, it's really good. It's a little bit different than, than, than Bitcoin, but still Bitcoin knowledge will help you a lot to understand how Ethereum works. And all the Ethereum forks also would work for you as easy as Bitcoin. Sometimes I would say that really different technology is Ripple and Stellar, which is fork of Ripple, created by the the creator of Ripple. Uh, it's also interesting. Uh, some people say that they don't like 
like a consensus algorithm there or how it's uh, put it there, but still it's working technology at the moment. So it's at the moment you can use it on your production system. So if you ju not just try to play with something which will be thrown away, but you would like to use it actually, Stellar or Ripple is still working technology. And there are some other technologies uh, less known, for example, Monero also has a working blockchain, private, uh, privacy-based blockchain, and it's totally different than Bitcoin. It's created, coded from scratch. So there is no single line of code copied from Bitcoin. Maybe they copied something, but actually they created everything from scratch. Uh, everything else is either not blockchain, just some distributed database, uh, or computing platform or something like that, either in, in very early stage, so anything can change there. I am a big fan, for example, of Cardano project. But at the moment, it's just research stage. And everything can be changed there. So everything you will learn on, about Cardano in a year can be deprecated at all. So uh, IOTA, for example, it's also super te uh, experimental technology. They don't try even to use blockchain data structure, like uh, putting uh, information in blocks. They're using uh, something like graph uh, tax. But still, it's not proven in any production system. There are a lot of bugs. There are no proven uh, uh, algorithm, like there are no um, proven use cases. And even there is a centralization because uh, they promise that some, if more people will use IOTA, it will be super fast. But actually, because everything is centralized right now, and they don't find the right way how to decentralize it safely. So when more people using Kyoto, trying it, it's just crashing. Maybe it's something changes, but actually it's really a research stage. And everything else is either early beta, either fork of Bitcoin or Ethereum, sometimes Stellar, either it's, it's still not ready to use. So today I will touch two of the most uh, known blockchains, it's a Bitcoin and Ethereum. And let's, let's, let's go and look at the main part of Bitcoin blockchain itself. So, first of all, it's, I would say that whole Bitcoin tooling you could put in three different uh, uh, pieces. It's a full node, it's uh, actually the, the, the uh, software which is syncing all the time with another uh, nodes. Uh, so it's a distributed database with a lot of uh, cryptography and uh, data verification rules. It's a uh, mining software uh, uh, which is uh, creating those transactions to blocks and it's uh, wallets of any kind. Any, any kind. So in the beginning when you look what Satoshi Nakamoto created, this Bitcoin core, the, the, the first uh, Bitcoin uh, application, it was everything in one application. You just, uh, I just remember how I downloaded it. It's immediately started to mine uh, Bitcoins. That time it was still possible to mine with the GPU bitcoins and so it's if it is, so it has, has options to mine it so it, it was a full node it was a mining software and it was a wallet with my uh, uh, private keys in one application and actually until now it could be like that but mining really really is put it aside because of uh, need of specialized hardware and uh, usually wallets these days uh, are separated it's a light wallets because uh, my mobile phone or my even normal computer I don't wanna uh, run like 200 gigabytes of blockchain all the time so so most of people don't use full node so 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 these days it's separated pieces so what's a full node it's uh, actually a ledger of transactions so we have a lot of computers nodes uh, uh, around the globe and they are all the time syncing information to each other so it's kind of distributed uh, ledger, uh, which tries to, to learn new transactions. And if you're creating new transactions, you're just sending to some of those full nodes, or through, through your own, or you're connecting to some of them, 
and it tried to uh, propagate that transaction over the network. And then miners getting those transactions finally, and what they are doing actually miners, so they are creating blocks, so they are catching transactions, and they are putting those transactions in that uh, like tree, uh, Merkle tree structure, of, uh, so it's easier to verify those transactions. They are getting to that block hash of previous block, so they are proving that I know the, the last block, this one. Uh, if somebody will, will, because everybody is creating blocks, so it could be like 10 different versions of the new block. And then miners are trying to find the hash of their created block, which is smaller than some number. And how they can uh, iterate? They are changing this one parameter, nodes. They can say one, two, three, four, five, or uh, just generate random numbers of nodes. It's like a number, random number. And when you're changing at least something in piece of data and making new hash a bit, you're getting totally new hash. And they're trying to change that nodes until they will find a hash which is smaller than some difficulty limitation. So when they found this, they propagating the block over the uh, whole network and saying, hey, I found it, I, 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 I knew, now this is block is valid. So uh, it's called the proof of work. So actually they are just fighting for a right to create those transactions. And they can choose any transactions. Even if there is like 2,000 available transactions in mempool, miner can accept only one transaction. They can accept only their own transaction. There are no rules which transactions will be unlocked. Each miner can put any tra transactions they want. But because of game, uh, game theory, they are taking the most expensive transactions because that uh, uh, takes mo most of reasons for them. So that's why when you're paying more transaction fee, th they are get taking your transactions first because they are greedy. Uh, th 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 that's why they are mining. And it's, it's nothing else than just trying to get a right to create a new block. Because everyone can create a block. But why your block will be added to blockchain? Well, it's just iterating nodes. Trillions of nodes <laughs> until they will find needed. And finally, wallet. So uh, there are a lot of different wallet software. Uh, it could be web wallet, mobile wallet, soft for it could be really limited wallet uh, some just uh, uh, wallet in I don't know like a gas station which accepting bitcoins just to accept bitcoin just to generate uh, addresses like many many different applications almost everything else we are doing with blockchain it's a different kind of wallets and here most of people don't know how actually blockchain works yeah and first of all like each transaction, it has a couple of uh, important uh, parameters. It has input. So there, there was some another transaction before from where you're getting output of 10 bitcoins. And that's your input. Yeah. And uh, you can take it output because you have uh, your private key and you can sign and verify that, hey, I can use this output. So this output uh, became a key to the new transaction. And then you can create as many outputs as, as, as you want. So for example, if I would like to send, if, if Bob would like to send for Alice uh, one and a half Bitcoin, but he has only one output with 10 Bitcoins, so he's taking the, this uh, output, then he's sending one and a half Bitcoin for Alice, and then he, is, he can send in the same transaction seven Bitcoins for himself, and maybe one, 45 Bitcoin for, I don't know, like uh, Peter, yeah? So he can, with one transaction, pay actually for two, three, or 10 services at once. So uh, it, many people think that like naturally, uh, when I'm creating transaction in banking system, so I'm sending from my money pool to yours, yeah? If for Bitcoin, that's not true. I can take a couple of things. So I can take from $10 from here, $10 from here, and then put $1 for, 
for, for 10 different people. One, 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 one. So it's, it's, it's works more, more like that. And this, uh, it's called UTXO, which is unspent transaction output. So these two un outputs are unspent. And until second transaction is created, like this transaction is created, this is also unspent transaction. But then, the same person, like address A, you see, uh, output for address A, it's getting more coins. Uh, and then, in third transaction, the same address, with the same private key, can put two, because for example, he, he needs to pay for some one, two bitcoins. But he, in this output, he has only one and a half bitcoin. How to pay two? So, in this, um, uh, like wallet, I have only one and a half, uh, so, so I, I have to take a little bit more from him. So I take all the money on the table and then putting a little bit uh, uh, forward. So then the main, main idea uh, be, be behind how uh, all the uh, coins are calculated, and actually when you see this number, so uh, you see not like just one account coins, but you are getting, uh, for example, D. How many coins has D? So D is avail, uh, can spend here 324 bitcoins, plus he can spend 0 75 bitcoins here. So in his balance, wallet will calculate, wallet will go through all the UTXOs, all the spent transaction outputs. We'll look which is mine, which I can use. Oh, I can use this, this, and this. Then it will uh, like uh, sum all these outputs and says that okay, it's available this amount of coins for you. Usually people uh, uh, think that blockchain works a little bit different. That's why I'm explaining uh, this one because when we will write code, we will deal exactly with this data structure. Ethereum actually works a little bit differently because Ethereum decided to go to use not a UTXO model but they decided to use account-based model. So on Ethereum, you actually have your address as a euro account. In Bitcoin, usually you can have like 20 different addresses that you can sum up in your wallet. Uh, but in Ethereum, usually you have one address. Uh, you're not able to send in one transaction from two addresses. Fine. So if I have in one account 10 ethers and another five, I'm not able to send 15 ethers in one transaction. In Bitcoin, I can. Uh, also, Ethereum has a balance. Actually, how many ethers this address can spend? It has a code, smart contract. So, uh, most of uh, our accounts on Ethereum, they, they don't have code. It's like zero, yes? Yeah? So, so there is no code. But actually, uh, Usual accounts and smart contracts, they're almost the same piece of code. Just smart contracts has a little bit code. And uh, general accounts, they don't have this code, it's just zero. Uh, and they have a state. So they have a piece in database where they can write something. So for this smart contract, you can have counter, like one, two, three, four, and when you are uh, doing transactions to, to, to this account, you can not just send money, you can send zero, but you can create a uh, transaction which will touch this function. It's more like API for a you know? you're, you're just doing API call, you're paying for that API call, some uh, gas, and then you're changing some input in database. So Ethereum is a little bit different. That's why in Ethereum you have uh, uh, a lot of ideas, for example, let's create a smart contract which will be betting application and we will bet that if, uh, or it's an uh, insurance application if tomorrow will be uh, snow, I will get paid my insurance because I, I, I need an insurance from snow yeah? like I'm creating some Olympic games and I need uh, beautiful sun yeah? and then it's uh, good, like we, we, we are making this deal, like insurance transaction, we're creating smart contract, and then Ethereum is uh, like each minute or like once in a day sending a request to some agreed online service to recheck what the weather, right? Actually not, 
because Ethereum is not able to send any transactions out of Ethereum. Ethereum knows only what it was told. So there is a notion of Oracle, of somebody who is like Oracle, which knows something from outside and set, uh, teaching us here in this room. And Ethereum smart contracts, they are totally blindless. Like they just hear transactions from users or services. And those services usually are called oracles. So uh, in Ethereum infrastructure, there are a lot of oracle developed. It's nothing else than just normal transactions are done by people and oracle transactions are done by bots, by scripts, by microservices, by, by something else. Yeah? But still, you, you have to feed Ethereum with data. And how you can believe that this data is not fake, that's a really, really big mathematical question and it's not really solved problem. That's why many people say that actually all this insurance and all this betting stuff, it's really weak because the weakest point is Oracle. You will attack not a blockchain, you will attack an Oracle which is sending information to blockchain. Uh, so let's sum up. We have full nodes, we have mining software, wallets of all kind, smart contracts, so because you have to write those agreements, that piece, small pieces of code which are stored in blockchain, and we have oracles uh, of uh, all kinds. So that's the main, like I would say, like five main uh, type of software which you can write if you would like to be blockchain developer. Uh, and then the question is, is Python really good to be used in blockchain? Because usually if you will look for any blockchain project, they will be written in C++, like Bitcoin Core, or even Go, like Get Client in, for uh, Ethereum, or in Rust, like uh, Parity Client, which is Bitcoin or Ethereum. Uh, solutions. Java is also really popular for for blockchain development. Uh, so the, the the answer is yes. Most of those languages usually are these low level languages because you need really fast sync over the network and Python is slow. So Python is not very good choice if you are working on a core protocol on blockchain full nodes itself. But if you, you're working on wallets and oracles and all this, another application layer, which is around full nodes, around database, then it's really good choice because it's fast, it's, uh, there are a lot of libraries created, it's easy to read. And actually most of developers are creating wallets, not a core protocol. Nobody's uh, trying to create a database with Python, but a lot of people are uh, ha having uh, web frameworks which are using those databases. Yeah. So here is the similar. So if you really want to stay with Python, you're not going to, to protocol development, just wallets, oracles, and all this stuff. Okay, let's look how it looks like to write code in Python uh, for Bitcoin. Uh, there are some links uh, to different libraries, better and uh, Worse, sometimes you will need to write to your own, and there are some wallets which are written in Python. A uh, really good Electrum wallet, Bitcoin uh, Armory, it's uh, almost full implementation of uh, Bitcoin, so uh, they're really, really good quality code which you can read. Many, many people use it in, in production code, uh, so I really recommend. And let's uh, and there are some links for learning materials. There are a couple of books, and we, which is good that in those books examples are in Python. Uh, there is an old one from Andreas Antopoulos, and programming blockchain Bitcoin. It's uh, uh, written by Jimmy Song. It's still pre-order stage, but it will be available in December. Uh, I, I, I used to be on Jimmy Song seminars, uh, the most in intensive seminar i ever been. It's like two days of a lot of math, coding, and uh, you better have to be slept well before the, uh, the, that conference because he's putting a lot of information, like for half a year of normal teaching. 
uh, and in this book you're actually creating the whole Bitcoin pro protocol from scratch. Everything. Like starting from cryptography, all, all the, uh, like maybe only like hashing function is not created from scratch, but even that could be created from scratch uh, 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 by yourself after reading this book. Uh, and he's not paying me for advertising. I just really liked how, uh, how he does uh, his teaching. Um, so okay, let's let's code a little bit, yeah. So let's just say that we are working with Bitcoin. Uh, this library supports a couple of other uh, cryptocurrencies like Litecoin, which is Bitcoin, or Dash, which is Bitcoin, or Bitcoin ca uh, Cash, which is Bitcoin. So uh, so, 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 so you just ch uh, change uh, and you can make transactions for, for Litecoin. A little bit changes uh, format, but. Not uh, okay. So okay, uh, and we will use testnet coins. Yeah? And now we uh, let's try to g generate address, just an address. So uh, first we need to create a private key. So let's just create a, 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 what is private key? It's just a sha. It's a hash. Uh, of some phrase. Let's use this super cool phrase. So that's my seed to create my private key. With this seed you can you can own my coins. Test, test net coins. I, I hope nobody is stealing from me coins. Uh, and now we have a private key. It looks like that. Uh, but uh, still good enough. And then we will create a public key. Uh, and uh, And that, that's your public key. Actually, your address is not your public key. Many people, uh, just to simplify, usually uh, people think that Bitcoin address is their public key. It's not. It's a hash with some addition of your uh, public key. So now we, are we will create address. And address is uh, pub to address. So now, have address. So actually from this seed, and usually when you're uh, launching your wallet, uh, uh, there is a piece of software which tries to randomize this seed for you. And usually you don't know the seed, usually you know only the uh, private key. Either these days there is this seed phrase of like 12 or 16 words, so from that words they are creating uh, uh, private key for you. So those words are used, are used to, to create a seed. Yeah. And now we can look uh, for this address. Uh, do we have any coins there? Yes. So yesterday I got a little bit of testnet bitcoins to this address. And you see that there was a transaction which has a free inputs because he wanted to send me this amount. Uh, but uh, he decided to a little bit uh, make it more private so you don't know from which uh, input you do something or he wanted to have this change bigger and he, he used three, three different output from, from previous transactions and uh, put it for me this amount and for himself, for maybe he even created new address and he sent a little bit more coins for himself. Uh, and actually what is interesting, uh, because I, I, I didn't point uh, before, uh, that here the question is, where, where is the transaction key? And if you will see uh, 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 that we have input of two and a half bitcoins, we have two outputs. One output is 0.75 bitcoins and another output is 174. <coughs> so there is 0 0.01 bitcoin left in any output. So there are no outputs for those in, 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 uh, for those bitcoins. So those 
bitcoins are, are actually your transaction fee. Miners have the right to use them. So if, like in the beginning, uh, like in 2012, 13, many people, when they had uh, their paper wallet, so they, uh, their paper wallet, they had only one output for like 10 bitcoins. And then they tried to restore this wallet. And they are creating transactions. Just let's try from this 10 bitcoins, half of it sent. And 9.5 will be still on my address. And that was a mistake. Because they were uh, doing one input of 10 bitcoins, one output of 0 uh, 0.5 bitcoin, and the rest of 9.5 bitcoins were sending to miners. So that was mining fee. And you're not able to get those coins back. Not fixed. It's not fixed. Like you, you, you have to specify where your output. So if you use, uh, because when you use output, it's already not UTXO. So it's already you can delete. It's it's spent. If, if I took something from my wallet and put it on table, it's not there anymore. When I will put it back, so it's a new output. So if I will leave something on table, that's left on the table and. Uh, uh, some cleaning lady can get <laughs> you just forgot so uh, really you have to be these days all the libraries have all the calculations so they will be specific and if you will not specify output they will try to send it back to your address so they will just create one more output here for the same address you were sending from so so you would not lose that but the, 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 that days all the uh, uh, Lips was really raw, and if somebody was not clever enough, oh well, I even know uh, that Bitcoin Info Wallet had something like this back, and one guy paid 50 Bitcoins as a transaction fee. <laughs> 50. And that was last year. <laughs> uh, so really careful. <laughs> Really careful when you, when you do. So let's let's create a transaction. Uh, to create a trans transaction, uh, first I want to send those bitcoins somewhere. So let's create a, a private key number two. Let's use this phrase. So later people would be able to check on blockchain how it works. So we have private key number two, we have pub number two, so it's a and we have uh, for example destination address. So that's uh, so somebody who will receive our coins. So we can check on uh, Blockchain Explorer uh, to be sure that on this address we have zero coins. Yes, zero. Cool. And now uh, we have to, let's check how many Bitcoins we do have. Yeah? Uh, so we do uh, say that our inputs, you see, So let's use our address. So that will be our input. So we will take all, all our transactions. Like we have an array of inputs. We could, if we, we would have like 10 unspent transactions, so we would see the array of 10. And we could then, when we are creating new transactions, use only one of it. We would say, let's use input number five. This time it's input number zero. zero. Out, output equal, and here we are creating array of. So to make it faster, I will just copy paste. Uh, so we say that value of five hundred thousand satoshi, because in blockchain all the calculations are in satoshis. Satoshi is the smallest piece you can have. Uh, 100 millionth piece of Bitcoin. 
So here I, I I'm taking this amount of satoshi and sending to destination address. Plus, I am taking a little bit for myself back as a change. It's it's called change. And as we see that in input we have 710,000. So that 10,000 satoshis will be actually our mining fee. So when miners will try to understand are they like our transaction or not, they will calculate how, how, how much we will left uh, on the table you know, for waiters. So the, let's look on miners as waiters when we are uh, giving them some money. And you, you get outputs, you just recreate outputs. Uh, and then uh, let's create a transaction uh, object. Transaction inputs all together, and then we'll need to sign transaction. Just look how it looks like. It's it, it will be just uh, some object with uh, some information. And script, Bitcoin has a, uh, also a smart contract language, it's called script. It's just very simple, not Turing complete. But actually on Bitcoin you can create mini programs as well. Uh, and this mini program is uh, just checking if your private key is, has rights to use this output. It's just uh, it's, uh, 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 checking who is the uh, owner of these uh, coins. And now we have to sign this transaction. So now uh, all those scripts will have also signatures, so it will be much bigger. Um, you see, all those actual scripts, they will get your public key, they will get a signature, they will uh, check uh, if everything else. So actually, if you got some coins on your hash, Nobody still knows your public, uh, public key. So even in the world of quantum computers, if you didn't spend your coins, quantum computer is not able to unhash. It's it's quantum safe. Uh, but then, in, uh, but then you don't have to receive more than once in the same address coins because that will be two outputs. And when you will spend first output, when we, you will use first UTXO. Uh, for this public key, you will reveal it your public key. So in this place, somewhere is our public key as well. And it's the first time when it's seen on blockchain. Uh, it's still current days really hard to create from public key private key. It's like million years for million computers, which can create a million hashes for millisecond. It's really more operations than atoms in the universe. So it's really, really hard. hard. Uh, or similar to the amount of atoms in the universe. Uh, so this cryptography is really, really strong, but in quantum computer world, if somebody would create, uh, uh, it's, it, they, they, they could, from public uh, key, create, like get your private key quite fast, uh, relatively. Uh, okay, so we have signed transaction. And now we actually, from this object, have to serialize actual transaction which can be sent to network. So this is how a Bitcoin transaction looks like. So 0, 1 means that it's a Bitcoin. If that would be Bitcoin Cash or Litecoin, uh, that beginning would be a little bit different. 
And then each piece of those uh, means a uh, like version of protocol, the amount, like how, how long the script, and uh, the script itself. You, you can go and parse this tra transaction. And if we, we could copy this transaction, we would go to the here on block explorer and would try uh, to, to make transaction through this application, which would propagate it to the network. It would be uh, uh, sent to network. And now the, the only thing uh, we will do, we will just push transaction to, to the network. This library is not a Bitcoin uh, client which is watching for another peers, which is making connections peer to peer and trying to send the transaction through the proper way. Uh, in those books uh, I advertised before, there are uh, explanations how to code uh, that one on Python as well. This one is easier because it's just connecting to some API which will propagate our transaction. So it's a little bit centralized, but it's good enough for uh, demo purposes. So now we got a transaction on blockchain. Most probably uh, we can already try to look. Oh, you see, yeah? we have one input which we just created and we have two outputs. These are our 005 Bitcoin and our change and a little bit for transaction uh, fee uh, left. And I think that here we already see that it's an unconfirmed, an unconfirmed transaction. What does it mean? It means that actually this transaction is not in the block yet, it's just in the pool and miners now added it to that uh, Merkle tree and finding uh, that nonce which would make a proper hash to, to say that that's a proper block. Um, it's hard to say how fast it will be actually added to block because it's a testnet, really unpredictable uh, mining powers. Uh, maybe one minute, maybe 25, but uh, who cares? We, we just made a Bitcoin transaction from scratch. Not from scratch, but at least we wrote some Python code. Let's go for Ethereum. There is also an upcoming book by the same author, uh, Andreas Antonopoulos, and David Wood, who is a creator of e EVM. Actually, many people think that Vitalik Buterin is the god. But Ethereum virtual machine itself, and yellow paper, it's a reference uh, uh, implement, like, uh, from where people are implementing Ethereum protocol. Was written by Gavin Wood. And uh, Gavin Wood is a, a founder of Parity company, some of you may be known because you, you maybe use Parity wallet or, or something like that. So this book was written by Andreas Antonopoulos, really a known person in the Bitcoin world, and Gavin Wood. And it's also upcoming in December. And I do believe that examples will be in Python. Uh, and there are a couple of uh, Python libraries uh, which I, uh, I suggest if you are starting from. So you should you, you have the similar libraries uh, that we used for uh, Bitcoin to create the transactions, to addresses, or all this cryptography part. Also, Viper, like for if, if, if you're a virtual machine, you can use a couple of programming languages. And the most popular is Solidity, which is somehow similar to JavaScript. But Viper is uh, inspired by Python. So today I will show an example of Viper because we are in Python meetup, kind of. Uh, Web3 uh, Pi, it's uh, uh, if you are creating your own uh, Oracle, most probably you will use this one library. And Populous is just framework to, to build, to compile, uh, to work easier. Python uh, written framework to work easier with uh, smart contracts on Ethereum. Because usually on Ethereum you're not dealing that much with money but with most of the tokens, smart contracts and people are spending more time there. So here, here is a smart contract uh, written in Python. So here you have, let me fish it, that's an input in database. Uh, 
which is publicly available. It should be in the form of a plugin. Uh, it's an auction store. It's also five uh, timestamp and timestamp. And it's actually we will try to beat who will win something, yeah? who will pay more. Uh, so, so actually here we are describing, like, like in Python, you, you have in memory uh, some, for, like, some, some variables. Just those variables will be persisted in blockchain forever when, when you will write to them. And you will pay for each, each time you will, would like to update them. Uh, and here you say that it's a public. That means that external oracles can touch this code. And when you send transaction to a hidden blockchain, this is public API. So you can touch this function. If it would be private, that would mean that you can touch this function only from another function of that smart contract. Yeah. You will first create the smart contract, this function will be called that. So it will just create the first values for those uh, variables and uh, say to the blockchain. And then this payable function, it means that when you will send your bit, you will uh, touch this function. And you will try to say if timestamp is not bigger than end of uh, this function uh, it, it will check if value is bigger than before value just simple simple logic you can just read this code and totally understand it so smart contracts usually it's a small piece of code where you can make a lot of mistakes and bugs and lose your, all your money uh, but usually it's really really simple piece of code uh, but we can try to compile this code. Okay. Let's go to some online editor and click compile. So this code is compiling and we are getting bytecode. That's a transaction. Ethereum transactions usually are bigger, that's why Ethereum blockchain is much, much bigger than the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, and because you actually have code there, yeah, it's like much more code. And now you have to sign this transaction uh, and uh, propagate to the network. How we will do that? Uh, we will just go for some web wallet, for example. It's a my uh, Ether wallet. Uh, and here we can deploy contract. We put our byte code. It calculates how much we can have to pay for this. And uh, now we just say that we are using MetaMask. so I can use, I say connect. Now I will sign the transaction. I could do that with the Python code. I will show that code later on. So now we have signed transaction and now we are propagating it to blockchain. And here my private key will sign the transaction. Ta -da! Now we are deploying the smart code. In some time, this our smart contract will be on blockchain and we would be able to send transactions to it. It's also quite easy uh, if somebody wants to write smart contracts. Uh, and actually people pay a lot of money for writing smart contracts just because they don't know what it is. But it's it's most easy part of blockchain development. It just takes from you logical thinking have not to make stupid mistakes because in smart contracts you're not able to change that code. If it's there, it's there. You're not able to update it, fix your bugs. So usually people are used to this web development when you can deploy five times in an hour and that's why they don't take careful testing. And when you're writing uh, smart contracts, usually when we write smart contracts we we, we spent like two days in the smart contract itself and then two weeks in writing tests for it. And it's like uh, 1,000 lines of uh, 
like smart contract code and 10,000 lines of tests around it. Just to test any use case, just to be sure that this will be not be hacked or you didn't miss something and stuff like that. So uh, Ethereum has this really interesting angle of how you work with it. That's why on Ethereum it's much easier to make mistakes. Just because you just make a typo or just don't put some variable public when it should be private. Or just stupid, stupid mistakes. It costs a lot of money. Is it possible to write like testing, uh, tests for uh, Python code? Yes, and you can write those tests in Python. If you are using, uh, actually now they are creating uh, integration with Populous framework, and that, that framework was created for Solidity, uh, but tests were written in Python, so, so you were testing Solidity code, code using Python, uh, and now Viper uh, are creating also integration with Populous. Mm -hmm. So actually you can write all of the, 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 most of the things in Python if you want. Vitalik Buterin is a big fan of Python. And that library we used before for Bitcoin was created by Vitalik Buterin. Um, okay, right, so let's go forward. And if we would look on Oracle code, or you, let's say mini wallet or something like that, it's also, I was just walk through the code, I would not type it, but uh, there are just important couple of libraries. Uh, and then this we say that our contract is uh, instance of uh, ABI, it's an API for this contract because you just have to know that what the name of the function, uh, what parameter this function accepts because this function, like when we name function something like uh, bid, uh, what Ethereum does actually it uh, takes bid parameters, hash it and takes the first four bytes of that hash and that's the uh, name of the function in blockchain, like uh, stored in blockchain. So Abby will uh, like uh, help you to write people readable uh, still names of functions in, in your code later on, and, and uh, have the translations uh, like how many uh, variables that accepts and stuff like that. So uh, and then I said that on this contract address, I have deployed this uh, smart contract with this Abby. Uh, then I'm creating an instance of that smart contract. Still, I don't do transactions to blockchain. But, and the read transactions are for, for free, it's zero. You can make them super fast, and as many as you want. But still, you, you just create a contract instance. And then you say that bid. Bid, it's a function of our smart contract. Here, yeah. So I am just executing this function. Uh, so, so just say contract instance bid and say that uh, I'm sending from my account zero uh, uh, and I'm sending this value uh, I'm paying that, that much uh, base uh, in, in Ethereum the smallest amount is uh, day, it's called day it's uh, 18 zeros after uh, so it's super super small and we, 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 we can print, and if you would print, that would be the transaction hash. We could go to, to any blockchain explorer and we'll see that our transactions are actually in blockchain and stuff like that. Similar, this is a very similar procedures as in Bitcoin. Just here, you don't have to think about inputs, outputs. You just say, here is my account. From this account, I am sending to this account, and I want to touch this function. So all the Ethereum work is much more similar to when you're working with APIs, you know, like with, with just external APIs. You just pay for each API call. Uh, and in this sense, uh, those two blockchains are quite different. I would say that Bitcoin is much, much better for money operations, because I used to consult some uh, payment providers, and we, we uh, calculated that to accepting bitcoins for merchants is much cheaper than accepting tokens or even Ethereum's. If Ethereum was created for smart contracts, all the transactions on Ethereum always will be more expensive. 
just because of structure how it works. I like now they want to create some interesting things and you know, with the zero knowledge proofs and uh, uh, things called Starks. So maybe they will they will make it much cheaper because of some really interesting uh, things, but that's for a different, uh, really different meetup. Okay, now questions about Ethereum, please. Because that will be a totally different part we will not call it anymore. So how is the mining fee specified over here? Uh, so in Ethereum, yes. they have something called uh, gas. Gas, it's not a coin which you can buy on exchange or somewhere else. Uh, gas, it's uh, when they are creating block, one block can have maximum 8 million gas. And each operation of your uh, smart contract costs a little bit of gas. Just sending ethers costs 21,000 of gas units. So, you, uh, how, how, much, uh, how many transactions maximum can be on Ethereum block? 8 million divided by 21,000. That's how many transactions you can put in one block, maximum. <coughs> and then, when you're calling uh, any function on smart contract, you, you're paying additional gas. Uh, if you want to store something in blockchain, you pay more for uh, 20,000 gas if you're storing totally new information. If you're updating that information, you pay 4,000. So for each each uh, piece of code, you're paying a little. And that's another uh, interesting thing of smart contract development, that sometimes people create a lot of beautiful structures, function, which is calling function, which is doing something, really beautiful code, abstract one, but expensive one. And then you're just refactoring it to a super simple, straightforward mess, and it's much cheaper. <laughs> just because each if each operation will cost for you gas. Each uh, um, temporary uh, variable will also cost you gas. Because that's a computation. Because every, each and every Bitcoin full node will have to run your piece of code. They'll use memory, RAM, they'll use CPU computations, and they have to do that in one second. For all those transactions in, in block. Because uh, they have a uh, window well, not that big window to find uh, the proper hash of block because this nodes and mining works uh, uh, really same as uh, uh, Bitcoin. So, 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 so to run all the transactions, they, they, they have to spend like as less as possible to have more time for actual proof of work to be faster uh, mining. That's why uh, and gas then how you how you pay ethers for gas and then when you're sending transaction. Uh, let's, let's, let's show. Uh, when I, I'm sending transaction, I say gas fee. How many ethers I will pay for one gas? So, even if transaction costs for me 21,000 gas, I can say that I will pay not one gigaway, but I will pay 100 gigaway. So, this transaction will be 10, uh, 100 times more expensive for and when was peak uh, of Ethereum usage, people had to pay a couple of hundred uh, gigaways for one gas. So the same transaction can be much cheaper or much more expensive just because of market is competing. Uh, and that, that's how they solved the spam problem. Uh, if, if transactions would, would be free, Everyone would try to uh, save something in blockchain and uh, it would be just spammed and uh, not, 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 uh, you know, uh, like, not useful at all. Uh, have I answered to your question? Yes. DAPS. Very, very fancy word. DAP. Decentralized application. Usually, I don't believe in DAPS at all. <clears throat> a year, maybe two years ago, I was a super big fan. Because you can create small applications right on blockchain. But 
crypto kitties and something like that. You can bet, do bets, like lotteries, like like you can store it. You, you can Tetris. You can create Tetris on blockchain if you want. Like it's 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 possible, no problem. Uh, and you have the centralized application. You don't have to think about all this, you know, syncing different zones because Ethereum does that. And you have uh, a, 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 like all these transaction goodies, so you know that your state will be changed, and if it will have error, it will be rolled, rolled back and stuff like that. But it just doesn't work in real life because it's super expensive. So all those DApps, finally, it's just tokens to be used in some other. Applications, which are usually centralized applications. Uh, if, if people want to put their centralized token to the blockchain, the centralized platform, even if they can change their mind at any time and say we, we don't accept these tokens anymore. So these tokens are worthless actually. Like you can put them to EOS platform even if it's shitty block. It's, if it's blockchain, it's super shitty blockchain. But the uh, recent uh, report says that it's not even not a blockchain, it's just a computation platform. Because you need auditability. That those tokens, like the, the, the uh, application creator, didn't create new tokens. Yeah, if you want to have in your game that many tokens or your uh, application. But they are centralized entity. If they would like to say that now we are accepting tokens from different address, for them it's just a couple of lines of code in their application. And they are not accepting these coins, they will accept uh, this token. Like, token. That's all. And all of your super expensive tokens will be worthless. In one minute. It's just inputs in database. So uh, the only reasonable place where blockchain is really needed is when you have decentralized applications. When you have, our, like for example, just imagine torrent, where, where you could pay for uh, like uh, syncing or downloading files. Yeah? So, uh, all the nodes which are, which are storing the, those files, they, they are accepting only these tokens. It's not one entity which is changing which tokens they are accepting. It has to be a consensus. Even if some will say that I am not accepting, he will just not get requests because nobody has his tokens. So, th there has to be the centralized network around that decentralized token. Otherwise, for what? What for you need those tokens? You just need like auditable platform where you can recheck them. It's, you don't need decentralized platform. And that's why for me all the uh, uh, DLTs uh, also looks strange. Because usually blockchain structure is more expensive than uh, standard uh, distributed systems. It's more cryptography, public, like it, it, you could say that even Git, it's a, it's a good uh, decentralized system because you, you, you have a chain of your transactions, commits. You can even say that I, I am putting those to blocks and block it's actually your pull requests. You know, you, know, like, uh, you, you can play with that and you will have a lot of cryptography there, beautiful structure. Just play with some mining. Like, uh, I, I don't see point why why you would uh, play with those smart contracts. Even if I was for last year creating a lot of code for contract, smart contracts, I still believe that there are some users, but much less than people think. I, uh, so so where is the uh, where is the future for cryptocurrencies? What it's for? And for me, it's a programmable money. When you really have permissionless accept access to API of your bank. Just imagine if you could access SEP Bank or Sweat Bank, your own account, without any permission of bank because you have like private keys to use your balance. And you could create some code or rules. You could decide that if something will happen to the third platform, uh, you will pay, pay me automatic transaction. You don't have to deal with banks, uh, uh, deal with all their bullshit. Another thing is interoperability. Yeah? So now if I am integrated with one bank, another bank will have this feature that doesn't work yet. But in blockchain, like, it's it's super interoperable system because all the time you have the same API. And you can program those money. You can have small, small rules inside each transaction, how you can spend the, this amount of money. Uh, and 
just imagine if you would be able to have uh, on your account some rule yeah, that this money could be uh, used only after your wife will sign <laughs> and uh, or, or your wife can spend your money only if she will wait for 20 minutes or 20 hours J -j just not to be super emotional and buy this beautiful uh, hat uh, so, 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 so that's the be beauty for me and in, uh, for me like decentralized systems uh, like chatting applications, email, like file sharing. Just imagine if you would like to have decentralized in Dropbox. How you can make a decentralized file storage without crypto cards? Who will, who will pay you with the visa? Not, visa needs a contract with some legal entity. You're not able to have decentralized platform. But cryptocurrencies, it's, it's something which allows us to have decentralized Dropbox. Uh, to, to to really uh, take a service, uh, like give a service for other people and accept some coins, yeah, like, which, like Bitcoin, for example, or some another cryptocurrency. And this really makes different point of view of how we can create new kind of system. When bots will be paid, you know, just imagine Internet of Things. Yeah, when uh, I, I go to gas station, the gas station can uh, charge my coins and uh, can, can be operated by one or another entity. I, I don't care, I just go and... Uh, my car, which is self-driving car, can go there, pay for gas with, with coins which are uh, topped up there. Uh, and uh, now uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, development uh, around Bitcoin and uh, another cryptos uh, called like crypto payment channels and it's Lightning Network, when not all transactions are on blockchain. Because it's really 